Here we go. There we go. Shazam. Right presentation. Um, so what I always like to do when I start is find out who's a Shazam user in the audience, just so I know. Okay, pretty good. Um, fantastic. So really what I want to do today is, is give you some, just some insights that, that we really focus on um, to, to continue to develop our app um, to the point where um, you know, people want to come back to Shazam and use it time and time again. So I really want to go through um, some of the things we think about, plus then go through one of the case studies um, that we've pulled together about one of the artists and, and why artists really want to work with Shazam. Um, and we've really developed this sort of relationship where they need us and we need them um, to help create the, the app that you guys all know. So to start with, wrong way, there we go, start with, does anyone remember Shazam before it was an app? Now, probably anyone, there's one guy there, but you had to remember this. I'm not sure if you, let me go back. It's the old Nokia ringtone. Um, that really was where Shazam was born from, okay? So what you used to do is you used to text 2580, you'd hold it up to the sound, uh, and we would give you the lyrics of the song, and then you could buy the ringtone. And that was really where Shazam was born from. But obviously, in 2007, 2008, when the first iPhone launched and the App Store launched, um, things drastically changed, and, um, and I'll say the rest is, rest is history. We've, na we've now managed to, um, again, be one of the first apps in the App Store um, and continue to have one of the highest ratings in the App Store, and that's really down to the product that we've created um, and the relationship we've built with our users that have now, you know, going on nearly 10 years now, uh, which is quite phenomenal. Um, it took us 10 years to get one billion Shazams, uh, and now we do about a billion Shazams every four to five weeks. Um, and clearly, as smartphone penetration has grown massively around the world, so has Shazam activity, and that's been super cool. We have now over 120 million monthly active users. We just hit our billionth download, uh, and things are going really, really well. In Russia, um, Russia's actually been a very interesting market for us. Probably about 18 months ago, it wasn't in our top 10. Um, in the space, last sort of 18 months, we've seen phenomenal growth, where we've just been downloaded 62 million times. Um, we have just under 9 million monthly active users, generating 40 million Shazams um, each, and, uh, each and every month. And just to give you a picture, this is a Saturday night in Russia, and you can see lots of activity, certainly around Moscow, but very much showing a great picture of the demographic um, spread uh, of Russian users uh, across Russia. And then if you want to go and have a look at Moscow itself, this again is another Saturday night. And what this really tells me is, once this loads up, is you guys spend a fair bit of time in traffic on a Saturday night, because you can see a lot of the main um, road arteries have got heavy Shazam activity as people are Shazamming in the car off to their night's activities. So one of the really powerful things about our smartphone is it gives us a lot of data, not just around geographic data so we can see where our users are when they're Shazamming, but also it gives us a lot of data that the labels obviously use as well. But really what I want to talk about today is, is, is see sort of three core areas, and that's what you need to do to maintain users, what we do to make sure our product um, is relevant with the artists and with music, which is essentially the core function of Shazam. And then importantly, the innovation. In this space, standing still is going backwards. And so we are cont continually innovating, looking for new ways where Shazam can, can be integrated and looking for new ways for Shazam, people to Shazam. Um, so I'll give you some great examples of that. So let's, let's dive into what we essentially call sort of four buckets of users, okay? Um, the first bucket is the bucket where you don't really want users to be, and that's what we call the lost soul. Luckily, we don't have many of these users, which is great. But what's a lost soul? Lost soul is someone who downloads an app. They're not quite sure what it was for. They may have clicked on an ad and downloaded it, and then they forget about it. Um, so what do you need to do to ensure that you don't attract lost souls? Uh, and what I would say is, and this is very much speaking from Shazam's point of view, we've, we haven't paid a dollar for a download since we were created. We've grown primarily from word of mouth. Uh, and that's been a significant uh, reason why we've managed to succeed. And if you can actually look at this, this shows that almost 50% of people who download the app have been downloaded because they've seen a friend either Shazam something or they've heard about Shazam. And that's been really one of the key drivers how we've managed to avoid having lost souls who essentially download an app, probably never open it and eventually delete it in two or three months time. The other important thing to avoid a lost soul is you really need to have a purpose to your app. What's the, what's the function of it? Why would someone want to come back to it time and time again and use it? If you think about most people only have 20 to 40 apps on their phone, 
They probably only remember half of them. So to get that mindset, to create the habit of where a person is going to come back to your app time and time again, you need to make sure that your experience, the function of your app, creates a wow experience. If you can't create a wow experience, at least give them an experience that gives them something added value, whether it's additional content, something that they otherwise can't get if they can't come to your app. So that's super important. The other thing which is really important is, is educating your users to, to how your app actually works. Luckily, Shazam is relatively simple. You press a blue button, and that's pretty much it. So we've got a kind of much easier job around educating our users around how Shazam actually works. But what I would say very, very importantly is make sure you educate your users how your product works. Make sure you educate them around new uh, innovations, new ad, uh, features that you maybe roll out in the latest update. So that's really, really important as well. But probably one of the most important things is you need to make sure your users use your app the first, within the first month they've downloaded it. So this is actually looking at Shazam retention rate. And if we can get people to Shazam within that first month, then, then the retention rate drastically increases, almost 25% higher than if they don't Shazam in that first month. So really, really important to get them to download it, make sure they know what they're getting, and make sure they Shazam or whatever your app happens to be, make sure they use it in that first week, a couple of weeks of once they've downloaded it. So it's super important as well. So let's talk about the next bucket of users, and that's what we call the uh, utilitarian, so, um, which essentially means a utility. Okay? I think one of the things that I think a lot of people really worry about when they create an app is they want to create this experience for a super user. So someone who's going to come to your app you know, every couple of hours to, to have an experience. And the reality is, is that that's very rare to get those super, super users. So be happy to have someone who comes to your app once, twice a week, or, or, or once, twice a month is not, not a bad thing as well. Don't be worried if you have got this utility user, nothing wrong with them. What you need to do then is actually how do you figure out a way to get them to come to your app more often? And that's where your product features, your continued innovation will hopefully drive that utilitarian user to what we call an explorer. So what's an explorer? An explorer is someone who comes to your app, doesn't just use the main function of the app, but looks for new things New, new functions, new ways to use the product. And this is a really, really important user for two reasons. One, they help you significantly improve your product. You start to see maybe some functions that, they're, that they're, they're starting to do that, that maybe you hadn't thought about. And so I've got a great example of that. The other thing you need to do is you need to give them more things to Shazam. And this is how you really convert that utilitarian user to an explorer. So we've done lots and lots of things to give our users more things to Shazam, whether it's Shazam enabling a TV program, uh, TV advertising. Uh, we do a lot of radio programming as well, cinema activities as well. So we want to give our users more things to Shazam and, and, and try and switch them from a utilitarian user to an explorer. Now, data is, is super important. But the data that I'm talking about is watching what your users do and seeing what they, see how they're engaging, how they're actually using the app, and then maybe creating a new experience. So, Eurovision last year. Anyone here a Eurovision fan? <laughs> see, no one wants to admit they're a Eurovision fan. Well, look, neither am I, but hey, people are. Um, so last year, we, we noticed a huge spike in Shazam activity across Europe between 7 and 10 o'clock at night. Now, that happened to coincide perfectly with when Eurovision was being aired across Europe on TV, which just happens to be live. The orange section is what we would call our organic Shazam activity. So that's people just generally Shazamming um, the night out with their friends and families or, or whatever. What you can see is there was, there was this blue activity here with two main spikes that generated over 1 million Shazams that unfortunately generated 1 million no, no results. Why? Because it was live TV, people were Shazamming a live, present, a live performance, and hence Shazam uh, didn't deliver a result. Now, we, we have a thing at Shazam called a recognition rate, and when the re recognition rate dives below uh, 80%, it sort of sounds a warning. Um, and this is what actually happened. So Justin Timberlake performed. Sweden, which definitely was very popular last year, saw two huge spikes that generated over a million Shazams, and unfortunately, didn't deliver a result. So what did we learn from that? Well, we just lost a million engagements, right? We just unfortunately failed 
for our users. Now, one of the challenges that we always have is around live music. When, if it's live, how do you recognize something that's just been performed? And that's a significant challenge. However, we managed to solve this problem. Uh, and this year, Eurovision will be Shazamable. So if you're Shazamming the artist, you'll be able to get some information about the, the program, the artist, the song, where they're from, etc. So again, looking at data, finding out when potentially you've missed something, you've missed an opportunity to give your users an experience, learn, learn from it, and then solve it for next year. So Eurovision this year, there'll be an experience, so look out for it. Last bucket, the sharer. This is kind of even more than a, uh, a super user. When I talked a little bit earlier around how do you get people to download your app, well, the best way is, is through word of mouth. And you know, essentially, social media today is, is the word of mouth. So when someone Shazam something and, then Shazam and shares it with their network, their friends, they're not only telling people, hey, I Shazam this song, check it out. They're also saying, hey, this is a product that I use all the time. Uh, and, that was, and that sort of referral has significantly helped drive massive amounts of um, new installs when someone, uh, when, when someone shares something across Facebook or VK or whatever their um, social network, network choice is. So we launched um, sharing functionality much higher up in our music result last year. And we saw a 21% increase in shares, which had a significant increase in installs off the back of it. So sharing is really, really important. Make sure it's a key component. I don't think this is revolutionary. Um, but it, we've taken it a step further. Because obviously we have Shazam users in over 190 countries, we can't just assume Facebook is the number one social network in most countries. So um, a lot of these countries here, excluding the US, of course, uh, where Facebook actually isn't the main social network in these countries. So um, in, in Russia, obviously, VK is the biggest social network here. So we moved VK to the top of our social network buttons, and we saw a huge increase in likes and shares um, from our Russian users. So again, make sure your product can be shared because sharing is the best way to get people to download your app uh, and make sure it's relevant to the audience that you're going after. So for us, it's around making sure that we work with the local players, not just global players. So that's really, really important. So the next um, phase, moving on from uh, users, is innovation. Now, we've kind of ridden the wave of smartphone and the world of apps that we know today. But along the way, there's been huge amounts of continued innovation that we focused on. Um, obviously, the App Store launched in 2008. Um, we launched Shazam for Mac. We launched Shazam for iPad. We launched Shazam for wearables, Google Glasses, iWatch, etc. We, we were integrated within the Siri 8.0 release 18 months ago. So you can say, hey, Siri, what's that song? We were integrated within Google App. To, same function, hey Google, what's that song? We were also, um, uh, and these are the, probably the, the latest integrations um, that we've been working with Snapchat and obviously Samsung on more, in, in, or more sort of um, Shazam integrations within the products. I suppose the key point that I'm trying to make here is, is that what we've always wanted to make sure that we focused on is wherever a user wants to Shazam something, it doesn't always have to be through the Shazam app, um, but primarily we do. But if someone is in an experience where they want to find out what that song is, we want to make sure the technology that's used is Shazam. Okay? And that's been, really been the, sort of the key focus. I think a lot of people naturally worry, well, hey, if you're allowing Siri to be able to deliver a, a result from what's that song, won't that cannibalize your audience? And potentially that was always a risk. But at the end of the day, if Apple wanted to use Siri, and give Siri a functionality to find out what that song is. We want to make sure the Shazam is there to deliver that. And obviously, we get nice branding within Siri to do that. So a couple of the latest innovations that we've recently launched, and this was launched in South by Southwest this year, was Shazam integration on the new Samsung smart TVs. So you can actually say to your TV now, hey, what's that song? We see huge numbers of Shazams, millions of Shazams coming from TV programming and TV advertising. So this is, again, a natural progression um, for our users is to start to use the smart TV to deliver these types of engagements. So that's the first one. We're actually launching, this is probably the most unbelievable one, we're launching a program in the US called Beach Shazam, hosted by Jamie Foxx, and it's a Mark Burnett production, so the Survivor and the Apprentice um, producer. So that's launching in a couple of months' time on Fox, so Beach Shazam on prime time. That's something that obviously um, is slightly outside the digital uh, innovation spectrum, but it's very, very cool for our users uh, and great for our brand. 
And probably the late, latest one, which was the Snapchat integration. Again, you can hold down the screen and um, Shazam will deliver a result and then give a Shazam experience within Snapchat. So what's the whole point of what I'm going through here is, is, is don't stand still. It, you have to continue to innovate. Don't be worried about losing your audience because essentially if you don't take advantage of these new ways for people to connect, um, and if you think about what Shazam is, it's, it's turned into a verb for discovering music. We want to make sure that verb can be used no matter what device or what other product the user wants to use, even though still most of our Shazams come from the main Shazam app. So the, the next thing as well is, again, continued product innovation as well. And anyone who's got Android will see we've recently um, significantly redesigned our app to, to leverage a lot more of the sort of um, using your finger to navigate through the app. So it's coming out to iOS in the next couple of months. Android users have already started to see some of the new things like the new listening screen, new music result, um, and some of the other swipe functionalities. So again, never standing still, always figure out how do you get people to actually start to use more of your functions within your product. Well, swiping is certainly a, a consumer um, um, uh, experience that people want to start to use. Instead of scrolling up and down, people want to scroll left to right. And so we've started to roll that out uh, across Android and iOS as well. So the next piece is the artist. And this has really um, been the sort of the fundamental success of Shazam. The relationship between Shazam and the artists, the content providers, is really, really important. If we talk about generating over 20 million Shazams every day around the world, that's a huge amount of information f that the labels really want to take advantage of. And if you think about how music discovery works, it's quite simple, right? The first time you hear a song, you naturally go, what's that song? And that's generally when you Shazam. You have that discovery before you ever go and buy a song or download a song or stream a song. You need to hear it for the first time. And then generally that drives chart activity. And when you drive chart activity, then you drive radio activity as well. So what we see, this is a great example of the music discovery funnel. You hear it, what's that song? You Shazam it, OK, I'm going to buy it. You then enter the charts, and then when you enter the charts, you start to get played by radio, and then you start to get more Shazams, more buys. And that's kind of how the music discovery ecosystem works. But what, what I want to do is actually take this a little bit further and, and use an example from a, a band called Milky Chance. Has everyone heard this song? It's not exactly a new song, but, but really this uh, case study that I'm going to take you through is a, shows a really good understanding how the artists are actually using this information. And we are actually unearthing um, stars before really even you've heard who they are. So Milky Chance, pretty big artist today, had a huge track. Back in early April uh, 2013, they uploaded that particular track onto YouTube. Two days later, we saw a huge spike in Shazam activity. And at Shazam, we have three types of charts. We have a watch chart. So this is where we're thinking, watch out for this artist, watch out for this song. We're starting to see some good action. Then we have our trending and then our hot charts. So we put Milky Chance's song um, in April into our, let's watch it, because I think it's going to go somewhere. Very, very quickly, it moved significantly up and hit our trending list. And when this started to happen, they started to move up the charts within Germany. And they started to become quite a highly Shazammed uh, artist and song. Now, if you fast forward sort of four months forward, they entered our hot list. And this is where they actually entered the, the top 20 of the German chart. Now, once it hit the top 20 German chart, they got signed by a label. And then they started to get played in lots of other countries around Europe as well. And so what you can start to see is... This shows the evolution over almost a two-year period of when Milky Chance was discovered, way back here. They hit, a, they hit the charts, sort of our earlier charts down here, very small Shazam activity, and then basically blew up and moved on. What you can see is it was almost a 22-month period before that first Shazam happened from YouTube that they actually entered the peak of the Billboard charts. 20-month, 22-month window from that first Shazam to having their peak in the charts. And so from a label, this not only gives them a great way to actually understand where they should be marketing their artists, but it's a great way for them to find out, one, should we sign this artist if it's undiscovered? And in Milky Chance's case, the answer was absolutely yes. And when they start to see these Shazams coming from other countries, across Europe and across the US, then they start to put a lot of marketing dollars behind it to promote the artist. And, and clearly this 
exercise can take quite a long period of time. But generally speaking, we can predict what song is going to be in the top 10 almost two to three months before they actually enter. This is just a great example of actually finding an unknown artist and tracking them through their ecosystem of, of, of rolling out their, their song. So very, very exciting. Um, we work with labels on lots of these types of things. Um, obviously, this is a great example of a long one, but most, a lot of them are much shorter. The other thing as well that we also work with a lot of artists as well is that generally speaking, when do you think most people should have a song? Anyone have a guess? What's the most common time for someone to Shazam a song? No? Well, yeah, that's true. But I, I mean, sort of, is it the first five seconds of the song, the first 20 seconds of the song, the first minute of the song? Yeah, I mean, so if you think about pop, pop normally starts with a big lyric and a big chorus at the start, so pop certainly gets Shazammed within that first 30 seconds. If you want to have a pop hit, you need to get people to engage right at the start. Um, Hip hop tends to be a little bit longer, um, and all the different music genres have different fingerprints around what is a, a top track. Um, and these are the types of things we share with the labels all the time. So, that's a really quick run through of Shazam, uh, our innovation focus, our user focus, and our content focus. Um, we've got a bit of time here now to open the floor for some question and answers if anyone has got any. Please don't be shy. Let me turn the music off. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I, I really like your three indicators, watch list, trending list, and the hot list. What is the algo behind each of them? The algo, you're probably asking the wrong person on the, what's the algorithm behind it. It's a, it's a combination of science and, and music knowledge. Um, within Shazam, we have both, right? We have the engineers who do, deliver the algorithm for recognition. That's probably the most important piece. Um, and um, based on that, we get a lot of data off the back end. Uh, and we, we look for peaks and troughs, not only of time of day, but also of particular songs. And once we see those peaks and troughs, then our music team will then investigate that, find out who it is, and then start to track it, um, add it to charts. So the actual adding to it is a bit of a combination of science and human intervention. How do you decide that in two days' time when you edit it from YouTube yep. So we, we basically look at past experience. So we, we know what, so if you look at sort of the top Shazams in any given period of time, they all have a very beginning, very similar beginning and end. So for example, let's just say two big artists, and I'm, I don't have this example here, when they launch a song on the first day. So let's just say Pink and J-Lo launch a song on the first day. We could tell by the Shazam activity very, very quickly which song is going to be popular. Which one's going to, which, and that's based on history, history of data. When you think about a billion Shazams every four to six weeks, that's a lot of data, that's a lot of insights around what people are Shazamming. And so when you actually start to compare ex past records, past songs, you can start to get a pretty good understanding of what's going to track. But, it, but essentially, if it doesn't, if it's not a big hit in that first window, it's not. Thanks for the talk. Uh, do you compare in your market uh, shares with your concurrents, uh, like SoundHound and uh, other services? Yeah. Um, in a regular base. So, I mean, you mean in terms and of recognition? Do you know the, the, the numbers now? <laughs> Users or recognition? Yes, So or recognition. So recognition, absolutely. We, we always want to compare ourselves against who else can do it. Uh, we, we don't just compare Shazami in a perfect environment. We compare Shazami in a crowd. Uh, we, we can, different Wi-Fi signals, uh, different bandwidth. So we, we do it across everywhere because I think most Shazams don't happen in a quiet room. Shazams are happening in nightclubs a lot of the time as well. So we do all of that testing and, and, and that's how we continue to make sure what we know that we deliver a better recognition. The biggest thing that really slows recognition is the, is the 3G, 4G coverage. That's the number one thing. But the beauty of um, those coverages getting a lot better and the smartphones getting much better more powerful is that our recognition rates get faster. Um, and I think our average recognition rate is only three, three and a half seconds now. And our um, recognition rate, so that's the percentage of Shazams that deliver a result, is around about 85%. That 15% is primarily people in underground uh, clubs with no reception, or in cinemas where there's no reception as well, um, or live music, and that Eurovision is a great example um, where sometimes we can't deliver a result. Yeah. But in terms of users, um, 
I think SoundCloud is probably the closest, but they're, they're, in some countries they're quite big, but they don't have a, the global audience or the, or the download or the monthly active user size at the same level of us. At the back. So yeah, so it's a good question. So we, absolutely, we work very closely with the labels. That sort of data that I just talked about in Milky Chance is gold dust for the labels, not just around A&E activity, uh, but also around how to actually put their marketing spend. I think labels have, you know, making money today is, is, is tough in the music industry. Um, so actually getting the insights around where people are Shazami is really, really important. So absolutely, we work with the labels on that data access. Yeah, so we, we have started to work with, um, a great example of this is um, advertising. A lot of TV ads will, will use music. Um, and so a lot of the times the creative agency will come to us and say, hey, we've got this target audience, females, you know, 18 to 34. Um, this is the type of user we really want to go after. What music would you recommend for our creative? So yeah, we do, we do a whole, whole host of different things. That's just one example. Uh, what are your main sources of revenue or net profit? Sure. So, um, interestingly, Shazam is very different to most of the other apps you probably know. We had a revenue stream from day one, so the SMS service, we made money from the, from the text. Um, so that obviously was our revenue stream then. Um, when the app store launched, luckily, most of the Shazams resulted in people downloading music, so that was our revenue from, from day one. And certainly for the next sort of five or six years, it was the primary source of revenue. Obviously, our advertising capabilities have We've really been focusing on that recently, um, and that's essentially um, uh, another revenue stream that we that we leverage. So yeah, and, and obviously the streamers coming online, Spotify, Deezer, Beats, these types of guys, we work with them as well. So we have sort of three very different sizes. But downloading music is still big. You know, something like 400,000 songs a day are, are downloaded through iTunes. So it's still a big part of our business. Oh, so we'll go this one here. Thank you for your speech. Um, you said you um, working with labels. Um, uh, what about uh, some rising stars, uh, which are who are not signed yet of, uh, under any label? Yeah. Uh, how can one promote uh, such an artist uh, to be in your database? So the Milky Chance is a great example of that. So we have a music team who whose job it is to find music that isn't coming through either the majors or the minor labels. And so they'll search things like SoundHound, uh, YouTube, other social networks to find sort of bits of gold dust like that. If we don't find you, you can find us. Uh, you can always email uh, music at shazam.com if you've got a song that you're launching and you want it to be in Shazam. So we, we, we proactively, we also get a lot of inbound requests from DJs prim primarily is, is a big source of inbound um, contact. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Josh, can you take us back in time, your 10 years that it took you to reach 1 billion users? Yeah. Which was the year that you had the hockey, t hockey stick hockey effect? Stick. Yeah. yeah, so, so it's, sorry, it's 10, sorry, 10 years at 1 billion Shazams. Um, good question. So, I I, so if I talk about users, so I joined Shazam back in December 2013. And at that time, we'd been downloaded 275 million times. Um, and, and so, you know, it was huge like that. In the space of the three years now, we've been downloaded 275 million, now over 1 billion times. So certainly in the last three years, three to four years, it's been hyper growth. Why is that? Well, smartphone penetration in, in, in the US and Western Europe hit 85% in most countries. Um, a lot of the emerging markets like Latin America um, has started to, you know, smartphone penetration went from literally nothing um, to 30-40%. So that all drove significant growth in this last three to four year window for sure. Anyone else? No? Cool. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.